or a web-based survey, or you can combine some of these. So all possible surveys that you can think of should fit into group administered, or telephone survey, or face-to-face, -face, or web-based, or a combination of them. And of course, what they, their names are is actually what is inside them, but we will talk in terms of what the advantages and the disadvantages are. In this case, you have a group of respondents, and you treat them as, as one group. So you deal with the group, and you manage them together, and they will respond to the question in the server. So here, you will phone them and ask the questions over the phone. Obviously, in the South African environment, you won't be as lucky as in the international domain, almost everybody has a phone. So this will be limit your study to those who have a phone. And you would probably have a telephone directory and then choose the participants out of a telephone directory or buy a list of telecom or wherever you can get these lists almost for free these days and use that as the sample frame and then phone the people. But it's going to be depending on who has a phone and who picks up. In my case, I never pick up a phone, so I'll never participate in this kind of a survey. Just fine. So a telephone survey requires that they have a phone and you will conduct this other phone. So what you do have is that personal communication. You can do what is the telephone survey where you base this on a population having access to a phone. The third one is the one that you're referring to, but it also comes up in the other one, and that is in-person interviews, face-to-face in-person interviews. So, of course, the response rates would be very high. Why? Because you can make sure that they complete all of this. By the way, there's a difference between non-response and missing items. Just talk about that one, thinking about that. In the one, you have a sample frame of the possible elements of investigation that you want, the respondents that you want to, want to uh, have respond back to you. And you might get that, that some respondents don't respond back to you at all. That changes your response rate. Then you have another category, and that is that some respondents don't respond on all of the questions. That's a problem. That's a problem. Especially if you find that they have, have the same questions that they're not responding to you. It means that you have a mistake in your questions. If you have just one or two places where there's a missing observation, it's possible to deal with that missing observation. What you do, if you end up having a spreadsheet with all the responses, you will look at the responses around that and give that missing observation the average response of the respondents around you. You follow what I'm saying? So here's a spreadsheet. Basically, it would look like this. So here are the respondents. Right. How many do you have? And here are the issues that you are investigating. And you find that person three here left a blank there. So what you do, you take the responses around that and you give that one the average response around it, which is okay. Uh, and you might want to look at the standard deviation of the variance to see that these other respondents agree to that general observation. But if this is Likert scale 1 to 5, you're not doing anything that's going to destroy the data in any way. So you find that the alternative is to almost use like a regression. So you treat that as a dependent variable and you model that in terms of all the other outcomes that you have. But that takes a little bit of while to do. But what you don't want is to keep that one open. You want to put something in a missing observation. All right. And then the one that you're probably familiar with is a web-based survey. Actually, this comes into two separate ones. The one is an email survey where you email the link to the participants. So they open that up in their emails and they will then go through this. And the other one is where you email them the whole uh, questionnaire. So they're both web-based, uh, but in different ways. 
So the web survey was right off the server. I, I'm sure you know uh, Monkey Survey. Monkey Survey is probably the most modern. You're familiar with Monkey Survey? I just like it. It's a huge amount of work to do. But once you've got it done, it works like a charm. So we should don't go to other people's questions. The advantage of these online questionnaires is that you can change your responses um, in a more natural setting. For instance, on a limit scale, you normally have one to five. But in this online domain, you have a little cursor that you can move around. So it's not discrete isolated values anymore, one, two, three, four, five. It's where this cursor drops, which could be between one and two, or between two and three. So in the online domain, it's easier to do. Well, the kinds of questions where you have a total of 100, and they're going to allocate weights to different issues, adding up to 100 works wonderfully here. It shows the doctor is 100, and then they know what they have remaining to do with. So a web-based questionnaire is great. Also, it's, it doesn't take a lot of time to do because normally you would just ask them to, to think a yes or a no or a block. And you can send this to thousands of people in one shot. So it's easy to do, it's very fast, and you get a lot of response back. The problem and the nice thing about this is that you are not there as a person. So you can't influence, but you also can't control the validity of the study or the validity of your selected respondents in that study. So it's got pros and cons, but it's probably the best thing to use. Of course, it covers a lot of things. You can't go into detail because you cannot ask the right questions. You can give spaces in this kind of an environment for the participants to complete their own sense of something here and there. But those spaces are limited. You would say, well, here's 160 characters, write in your own words something, and that you can add. But it's about the structure of the questionnaire and the structure of the responses more than it is about the open spaces, the open intentions of the representative sampling, uh, what kinds of respondents do you have? Is it a hetero heterogeneous population or not? Um, what kinds of questions can you include? Uh, possibility of not understanding the answers or what you want to achieve? And I have sort of listed under every one of those what I think is good and bad about every one of these types. So the greens, of course, are uh, the places where it's good and the uh, almost grades are the places where they're not good. So depending on what you want to do, you can then select a specific type of questionnaire. You'll notice that the uh, surveys, the in-person surveys have a lot of green, so that has a lot of advantage, but it really depends what you want to do. But if you want to have complex questions or lots of questions, then a web survey might be the better one to do. There's very little about a mail survey that's good other than the fact that it goes very quickly. But you've got to look in terms of what do you want to achieve to decide which ones of these do you really want to do. So there's a, a summary of all possibilities with regards to the four different types. Okay. Now we're going to talk for, um, well, at length this morning about the survey questions. What goes, how, do, how should the questions look? What goes into the questions when you plan the questions? Of course, the questions are the centerpieces of what is in your survey. So you've got to spend a lot of time writing the questions correctly and giving the right options per question. So how you word them, how you convey your message is really going to influence the response rate. 